Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here today and I'll speak today on this theme of <clears throat> of how there is violence in the epics and how sometimes forgiveness can be cruelty and punishment can be kindness. So normally we think of forgiveness as oh somebody has done something wrong, just forgive them. And that's the way we think we should be functioning. While that is true on most occasions, not always. But there are times when if we forgive someone, that simply facilitates that person to do further wrongs. And therefore, the result is that they do not reform. Rather, they continue to do wrong things. And therefore, it's important to understand uh, what is the right way of acting. So here, Lord Ram seems to be speaking very harsh words to Ravad. So normally people think of God as loving, as kind, and that is true. So there is a theologian who has written a book, it's called God is not nice. <laughs> now that can seem like a provocative title, but the idea is that we shouldn't reduce God to like a sanitized conception of nicety. So yes, God is kind, God is benevolent, God is our supreme untiring well-wisher. Well -wisher. But that doesn't mean he is going to tolerate anything and everything. That doesn't mean necessarily that we can say that God is nice in our conceptions of nice. Nicety. Why is that? You could, uh, uh, I'll take this class in three broad parts. First part about uh, is will be about how being nice is not always nice. Mm -hmm. Second part is how God is benevolent. Uh, and third part will be how letting people get the consequences mm -hmm. of their actions is sometimes the most benevolent thing to do. So, so the first point is that, that <clears throat> when we talk about actions in this world, so we all think that it's nice to be sweet and kind and that's true. But if we consider a child who has some disease and has to be taken and given an injection, and the doctor says, doctor wants to give the injection, the child starts crying. No, 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 no. no. I don't want an injection, I don't want an injection, I don't want an injection. So now if the doctor starts being nice, it's okay, you don't want an injection, I won't give it to you. Then, in the name of being nice, the doctor will end up being violent to the child. So sometimes we have to go beyond nicety to do our duty. Now of course, as a part of our duty, we need to be polite and kind and courteous. But there are times when strong action is also required as a part of duty. So here, when Ram is speaking such strong words, you see, you are the lowest of demons. You are just like refuse from the body. You are reprehensible. Now, why is he saying this? It is, you have to, just if we look at somebody's words, then it might seem, why are you using such terrible language? But we have to see the context. See, nowadays is the age of political correctness, where the idea is don't offend the sensibilities of anyone. Yes, we don't want to uh, intentionally, knowingly, or needlessly hurt anyone. But sometimes the truth is hurting, it may have to be spoken. The political correctness is basically what? It is the it is the ele elevating sensitivity above sensibility people are more sensitive than sensible like a doctor who is more sensitive to the pain of the patient and not sensible enough to give the injection to the patient so and it is not even in considering sensitivity being sensitive more important than being sensible it is like posturing that i am so sensitive 
it is parading to the world, see I am so sensitive, I don't speak like this, I do like this, you should not do like this. And because of this, sometimes the truth is just not communicated. So now Ravan, he, he was the king of the demons. And he was so arrogant, so self-righteous, so proud, that he never was ready to acknowledge that he had done anything wrong. And that's why he had to be spoken to strongly. So it's uh, for him, his action itself to abduct Sita was grievously wrong. Sita was a righteously wedded wife of some other person. Not only that, as it is said over here, he did not even have the courage to face Ram in a, in a head-on battle. He came behind Ram just like a Kshatriya, just like a dog might steal something from a house and the owner is not there, some fool. So he says that it's first of all, because we can pile up his wrongdoings. First is abducting some person, abducting a person who is a, already a wedded wife of someone, abducting someone who is in the back like a coward. On top of that, he was not just a warrior, he was the king. And then after that, to hold on to Sita, he sent all his warriors, generals, relatives, brother, and even his own sons to death. So, if we all do wrong, there are consequences of that. But the more powerful we are, the more dangerous the consequences can be. In fact, Mandodari, now it's interesting, normally whenever an epic, whenever a story is told, from which angle is the story being told is very important. So, like, the, like say if we want to, if somebody is to be recommended for some position, say for initiation, we might, if we support that recommendation, we might say that, he had problems earlier, but he is stable now. But somebody doesn't want to, wants to disapprove of their initiation, they can take the same points and say, he is stable now, but he had problems earlier. Just give the different twist and the whole emphasis changes. So we see the angle from which this is being spoken. So here we see Ram's speech, the Ramayana is a classic big book. And not just the Valmiki Ramayana is huge, 24,000 verses. But even there are many, many other books further describing Ram's pastimes. The Mahabhagavatam gives only two chapters to the Ramayana. And Shukadeva Goswami says, you have heard this before. And Shukadeva, uh, uh, Parikshit Maha is interested in Krishna because Krishna is the Lord to whom he was directly related. His relatives were related rather. So he just gives two chapters. And even in those two chapters, what is his stress? It's interesting, now Ram's verse to Ravan will be spoken and then Ravan will fall dead. And then several verses will describe Mandodari's words of lamentation after the death of Ravan. So it's interesting, instead of describing the Ramayana, why so much focus on this one particular event? At one level it is because the whole Bhagavatam is death-centered. Parikshit Maharaj is about to die. And if you count, there are a number of characters whose death is not just mentioned but described. So that the reality of death can register in the consciousness and thereby the right course of action for living before we die can be chosen. So here Ram is reproaching Ravan for the kind of action that he chose. And Mandodari will also lament. She is a wife, so she is... She doesn't directly reproach Ravan, but she laments and she says, what you've got is a fit destination. She's naturally devastated at her death, but it's not unexpected for her. So she says, especially when Indrajit, her son is killed, he says, oh Lord, he says to Ravan that, you know, the, the fire of the, your lust for Sita has now become a bonfire has become a sacrificial fire in which you have put as offerings countless warriors. You put as an offering your own brother Kumbhakarna. 
and now you have put in that fire your own son how many people more will you sacrifice how many people will have to die in the fire of your lust just give up the desire for sita so this strong speech she speaks but ravan is so distorted in his thinking he says that if i had to give up sita if i were if eventually i was going to give up sita then why did i fight till now so long all those warriors who died eventually when i meet them in the next world what face will i show to them if i if they ask me if you are going to give up sita then why did you cause us to die so this is the irony or this is stupidity of the thinking he is thinking about how he will face people in the next world he is not thinking about how he is going to take care of people in this world he can't face ram the writing is on the wall but not only that and there are so many orphans so many widows whom he has to take care of so when one has a distorted sense of things one just doesn't see anything except those things that go with one's world view is an american comedian who said that i have already made up my mind now don't confuse me with the facts <laughs> don't confuse me with the facts so ravan was like that and for such a person with a such a devious despotic destructive mentality there was no way to save him from himself this is a interesting concept this we need to be saved from ourselves what does it mean the soul is here the body is here the body and the mind have by past karma acquired a certain momentum now we do have free will by which we can we can slow and reverse that momentum but sometimes some people are going in a particular direction so fast that they just can't be saved so the only way to save the soul from the body and the mind is to separate the two it is an extreme situation it is never to be done indiscriminately or as a first course of action but sometimes the only thing that is going to happen as long as the soul and the body are together that body is going to be used for causing more and more harm to oneself and to others so that's why now when ram is speaking such strong words to ravan the point is that he is making ravan aware in a jolting way of what wrong he has done because ravan is a king the emperor nobody is usually going to speak strongly to him and when people live in their own echo chambers echo chamber is a place where the only voice we hear is the echo of our own voice so nowadays many people live in echo chambers because they just surround themselves with people who are like minded or people who just think like them like minded is fine but you also need to understand other people's perspectives so being nice is not so nice because some like sometimes because it can end up causing great destruction the person who is destroying uh, who is hurting or destroying others needs to be checked so the lord's actions if you understand that is a soul that everybody is a soul then the lord is performing a surgery where he separating the body from the soul so that that soul will not be under the as you could say the momentum of the body being impelled toward more and more wrong things so that was the first point that being nice is not always nice a second point is that the lord is always our well wisher that even when ram is is speaking such harsh words to to ravan and he is going to kill him with his next arrow but still ravan does not ram does not have any intrinsic enmity towards ravan and that's why after this happens after ravan is killed then his last rites are to be performed and he has no sons left to perform his last rites and vibhishan is reluctant saying that he such a evil demon you know 
I don't feel that he deserves to have the last rites performed for him. And Ram says no. He says the soul is always pure. And whatever wrongs he has done, he has got the consequences for that. Now, do your duty so that his soul can go to the next destination. So Ram does not have any intrinsic enmity towards Rava. There can be circumstantial enmity. Or not even enmity, you could say. Circumstantially, the Lord can act as if he is opposing someone. But even when he is opposing someone, he is always the well-wisher of that person. So, being the well-wisher of that person means that he will always act for everyone's benefit. And this dynamic we see very interestingly in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna tells in the Bhagavad Gita 11.33 that by my arrangement, all the enemies have been killed. Mayai vaite nihata purma meva nimitta matram bhavasavya sachi. Mayai vaite nihata. By my arrangement, they have all been killed. Arjun, you just become an instrument in the fight. Now, before this, Krishna has already said in 5.29 that Suhrudam Sarva Bhutanam Yatvamam Shanti Mrichati. He says, Suhrudam Sarva Bhutanam. He says, I am the well wisher of all living beings. So it's interesting. Krishna says, I am the well wisher of all living beings. And by my arrangement, everyone, all the most of the warriors on the Kurukshetra warfield are going to be killed. So Krishna is the well wisher of of everyone but sometimes his how he is the well-wisher needs to be carefully understood just like we could say at a broad level the government wants the good of all the citizens but if a student is law by if a if say a child is law abiding or a youth is law abiding the youth may get a scholarship to go in college and if the youth is law breaking the youth may have to send to a uh, reform institute to uh, jail, penitentiary, whatever. So now the government, government's equality is in its reciprocity. Its equal equality is not an absolute virtue, meaning e absolutely equal treatment towards everyone. So equality means reciprocity. This is how you act, this is what you will get. This is how you act, this is what you will get. So the Lord reciprocates with everyone. In fact, this is Nanar Sajitada, she is coming soon. So, in the seventh canto, the, the defining, the driving question of that canto is, how does, how is the Lord equal? Because he is the, he kills Hiranyakashipu and he blesses Prahalad. So how is he equal? He is drastically partial. He favors the gods and he punishes the demons. But then there's a Bhagavatam commentator, Vamshidhar. He gives a beautiful commentary and he says that at the end of the Narsimha Leela, both Hiranyakashipu and Prahalad came on the lap of Narsimha. Both got the lap of Narsimha. In that sense, the Lord was equal to both of them. <laughs> but the way they came on the lap is different. Because, because Hiranyakashipu was fighting and he was terrorizing. So when he came on the lap, it was the last moment of his life. We have a devotee in a hospital in India, uh, Bhaktivedanta Hospital. So there they have a, in the operating theater, they have a picture of Narasimha Dev ripping apart the intestine of Hiranyakashipu. So patients come over there, hey, what is this? Especially some people who are not from an Indian background, hey, what is this? He says, that is the original operation. <laughs> and then what was the result? He says, operation successful, patient liberated. <laughs> patient liberated. <laughs> So, the idea is that the Lord is the well-wisher of Hiranyakashipu also. But because Hiranyakashipu was demoniac, the Lord brought him on his lap. He gave him equal treatment, but it's an entirely different uh, reciprocation of him. And because Prahalad was devoted, when he brought him on the lap, he seated him on the lap. This is a beautiful vision of uh, 
Lord Narasimha Dev, where he has got Prahladi, seated on the lap. Ekena chakram aparena karena shankham, anyena sindhuta nayama valam vyatishthan, vame tarena varadabhaya padma chinnam, lakshmi narasimha mamadehi karavalambam. This is the Karavalamba Sotra, which says that, my dear Lord, please give me the shelter, the blessing of your lotus hands. Is describing the vision that Ekena Chakram, that the Dhi, Lord Narasimha is prepared, he has a chakra in one hand, Aparena Karena Shankham, he has a shankha in the other hands. And in the third hand, he says, Annena Sindhutanayam, he has got Lakshmi Devi seated on his lap. And in this vision, although Lakshmi Devi is the consort, Lakshmi Devi is small and the Lord is very big. And sometimes, when instead of Lakshmi Devi, there is Prahlad over there. So, Anyena Sindhutanayam Avalam Yatishthan. And with the fourth hand, Vame Tarena Varadabhaya Padma Chinnam. His hand has a lotus on it, sign, and he is giving blessings through that. So, that Lord, please bless me, please give me your shelter. So, the idea is, the Lord is equal to all, but his equality is his reciprocity. So, he is just as kind to Ravan as he is to Vibhishan. But the way in which that kindness is expressed varies. And the last point I will make is, so the first point was that being nice is not always nice. The Lord is, second point was the Lord is always the well-wisher of everyone. And the third is that sometimes letting people get the consequences of their actions is the best way, to, is, the, is the kindest thing we can do for them. How is that? One of my friends is a child psychologist and he is telling me that, that there are many places, many occasions when overprotecting a child can damage that child. So parents may want to say that, oh, oh you know, I don't want my child to get any harm. That's true and it, it is, yes, parents obviously don't want children to be harmed. But the children have to learn to fend for themselves. The children are very small, at that time they, they not need the love that guards. But as they grow up, they need the love that guides. Now you cannot always keep offering others the love that guards. Because we are finite beings, the world is a big place, how much can we, can we guard anyone? So, if, if constantly the love that guards is offered, so now this is broadly speaking, this is generalization, but generally it's like uh, the mother gives the love that guards. And that's, see, especially when the infant is very, very small, at that time the infant is always right. That means even if the infant wakes up at midnight and starts crying, the mother fondles the child, caresses the child. But then as the child starts growing up, the child, okay, you don't disturb at night. The child says, suddenly wakes up at night, I want to play. No, no, sleep now. In the daytime you can play. Isn't it? So, the child has to be disciplined. So, the mother is more, we could say, psychophysically inclined and equipped to give the love that guards. So, if the child comes and says, oh, you know, this, this boy is cool or this girl is so harshly to me, the mother will console, so says, everything is alright and things will be alright. But the father is broadly inclined to give the love that guides. The fathers are not very helpful when the baby is just one month or two months old. They don't know what to do over there. <laughs> but as the child starts growing up, then the child needs the love that guides. Okay, you know, sometimes people will be bad to us. And we, we have to live with it. We have to develop some more thick skin. Because how many, how many bad people can we get out of our lives? Even if we get out many bad people, still some people will turn bad also, those who thought we were good. So sometimes the children have to learn to uh, learn to deal with issues on their own. So of course this, this does not mean abandonment and irresponsibility, but responsibility means providing people, providing others the facility to grow. If we, if we can prevent growth by not giving any protection, we can prevent growth by giving too much protection. 
So the point here is sometimes, say if a child does not behave properly, child does not play a sport, prop, play a sport properly and then other children start uh, chastising that child. And the child goes and complains to the mother and the mother goes and, or the parent and the parent chastises other, other kids. All that will happen is, the kids will start saying, this child is a crybaby, we don't want to play with this child. But the child takes care, okay, okay, you know, if I do this, other kids do like this, so I will not do this in future. So then the child learns. So sometimes we have to experience the consequences of our action to learn how to act properly. And if we don't do, if we are always guarded from the consequences of our actions, then we end up uh, doing those actions more and more. And especially when the children grow up, see, when a baby is very small, whatever he or she wants at that very moment that the parents will provide. Baby starts crying, okay, you want you want milk, you want food, you want this, you want this, immediately they will provide. But one part of growing up is learning to accept no. The child grows up and says, I want this toy. Well, okay, the parents may say, not now. The child can start crying, no, I want it now. The parents say, no, oh, I'll give you whatever you want. Okay, fine, I think that is love. But then the child grows up, becomes a teenager, a youth, and the child says, okay, I want this partner. And that partner says, get lost. And what does the child do after that? The child has never learned to accept a no gracefully. Then the child goes into temper tantrums, becomes violent, becomes depressed. So, you know, I was just uh, last year at a conference on mental health and spirituality. There we're talking about addiction. So normally when people have get addicted, they need, they need some counselling and support. But quite often, uh, their significant other also needs some counselling and support. Because sometimes the significant other can, act, can become a codependent. And if they protect them, okay, you know, somebody gets drunk and does all kinds of crazy things and then uh, the, their relative, their friend, their spouse, their brother, or whoever comes and picks up all the pieces each time. Then what happens? They get facilitated in doing that wrong. So the codependents also need to need sometimes counselling to know when to not intervene. Yes, generally when we love someone and we see them hurting, we want help. But sometimes our help can cause harm. So uh, when the Lord, He lets the consequences of our actions come upon us, He's not being unkind. Sometimes the consequences of our actions are what are required for us to grow up. And that's why his, his kindness is in providing us impetus for growing. Not in simply making us feel good wherever we are. So, that, so if you understand this, you know, I'll conclude with this point that nowadays many people think you should have self-esteem. Many people have self-esteem issues. Yes, it's, it's we all need self-esteem, but what self-esteem, if somebody says, you know, oh, you are perfect the way you are right now. Well, that is an extremely narcissistic thing to say. Isn't it? All of us have many glaring deficiencies. Now, it is not that because of our deficiencies we are rejected. It is not that we are condemned. But generally, self-esteem comes not simply by feeling good about ourselves as we are, but rather Feeling self-esteem comes by having a valued direction in which we want to move. And having the confidence that I can move in this direction. Okay, I have these issues, but I'm working on these issues. And even if we take small steps in that direction, say, okay, I want to become a little more disciplined about this. I want to become, manage my emotions better in this situation. I want to learn this skill better. So when we have some direction to move in our life, and we start moving in that direction. And we need enough confidence that I have it in me to move in this direction. So then as we take steps forward, that is where real self-esteem comes. So helping, uh, helping someone to move in a valued direction, that is real kindness. And that is what the Lord provides us. So Ravan is in no is in no way interested in moving in a value direction right now. He's in fact moving in the entirely opposite direction. So the Lord's kindness comes to him by killing him so that the soul separated from this body in a future life can continue its spiritual evolution.
And similarly, when sometimes difficulties come in our life, it's not that the Lord is not there with us. The Lord is not protecting us. But sometimes he may protect us by giving us impetuses to move, to evolve spiritually. So rather than thinking that, why is Krishna not helping me? We can think, you know, how can I, how can I help myself in this situation? How can I move toward Krishna? What is a value direction I can move in this situation? And if we focus on our spiritual evolution, on the growth of our consciousness toward Krishna, then we'll find that he will always give us some resource or the other to evolve toward him. Even if circumstances don't change, even if the difficulties remain, still some path to move toward him will always be provided. And as if we focus on that purpose of evolving toward Krishna, we'll always find some light, no matter how much darkness is there around us. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on this theme of how God is not always nice. That sometimes letting people suffer the consequences of their action is kindness. And sometimes forgiveness can be cruel. And punishment can be kind. So I, stop. I spoke three main points. First point was that that <clears throat> being nice is not always nice. So here Ram is speaking very harsh words to Ravan. And we may, in today's world of political, kind, political correctness, such words might seem very jarring. You, know, you are like a human excreta, you are the lowest, you are reprehensible, you're this, you're that. But why is he speaking like this? We have to look at, uh, political correctness means sometimes being sensitive is, or posturing about being sensitive is elevated above being sensible. So a doctor needs to be gentle and warm with the patient. But even if the child doesn't want a medicine, take an injection, the doctor has to give. Doctor has to be beneficial more than nice. And so then the second point, uh, so in that connection, Ravan has done a series of horrible actions. And because of his lust, not only has he violated grossly ethical principles, not only has he been cowardly, but he has caused the deaths of hundreds and thousands of people just because of his selfish, lusty desire. So this is a, in, his, in the fire of his lust, thousands of warriors, including his own brother and his son, have been sacrificed. So he has to be made aware of the gross wrongs that he has done. And Ram words are meant to jolt him into such awareness. So sometimes, the only way we can be saved from ourselves, or a person can be saved from themselves, is by separating them from the body, just the soul from the body. Because the body has such a strong momentum in the wrong direction that they just can't be stopped. And this is such an emergency situation. And the second point I talked about is the Lord is the well-wisher of everyone. Even those whom he's opposed. So he, he spoke strongly to Ravan and he killed Ravan. But then when Vibhishan didn't want to perform the last rites, he told him you have to perform the last rites. So the Lord's apparent opposition to someone is only circumstantial. It is not intrinsic. The Lord's equality is not a simple neutrality. The Lord's equality is equal reciprocity. The government should be equal to all citizens. But that doesn't mean it gives wrongdoers who are meant to go to prison the same facility as it gives to students who are studying diligently uh, uh, to get a scholarship. So the Lord's reciprocity is seen in Narasimha Leela where both Hiranyakashipu and Prahalad get the lap of the Lord, but in entirely different ways because their disposition was different. And the last point I talked about is that we need to, sometimes we need to get the consequences of our actions to grow. Oh, so overprotected children uh, cannot grow properly. So there is a love that guards, which is maternal, which is you could say feminine, and which is needed especially in the infancy of the child. And in the later ages of the child, the child needs the love that guides. So if the child is not exposed to the realities of the world, is always protected from bad people, bad things, life's reversals, life's refusals, then when the child grows up, the child is not equipped to face life. If somebody is an addict, then if they're codependent, keep protecting them from the consequences of the addiction, the addiction goes further and further. So the Lord does not become a codependent for, with us in our material attachments. So, so when 
we, when something bad is happening in our life and we are praying to the Lord, if it appears as if the Lord is not intervening, it is not that he doesn't care. It is that he wants us to grow. So rather than looking at the material difficulties around us, if we can see how can I grow toward Krishna in this situation, we will always find some light by which we can keep moving towards him. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Okay, a, so is death also kindness for all souls? Yes, see death is a forceful reminder of the temporary nature of the world which forces us to think about the eternal. Not forces, you could say, impels us to think about the eternal. So basically, Unless the temporary were temporary or unless the temporariness of the temporary were brought in front of us, we would not, never think of the eternal. So in that sense, death is meant to force us to introspect. What lasts? What counts? What should I really live for? So Krishna teaches about the eternal world through his words. When Krishna says, time I am, now broadly speaking, time does all three things. Time leads to creation, time leads to maintenance. Uh, without time, we couldn't even, what would you mean by maintaining things, isn't it? Without time, there could be no creation. When, say, we sow a seed and a nice sapling and a tree comes, time has to flow for that tree to manifest. When a baby is conceived, time has to flow for the baby to be born and to grow. So time leads to creation also. Time it leads to maintenance also. And time leads to destruction also. In the Kurukshetra war especially, destruction was what was prominently going to happen. And because Krishna has manifested a destructive form where he says, where Arjuna sees the warriors entering into his mouth and dying. So that's why he is talking and stressing about the destructive form over there. So yes, destruction is also kindness. Because destruction, uh, in, a sense, in a forceful way, reminds us of de death and destruction remind us of the temporary nature of the world. And then they impel us to explore spirituality. And as far as the other warriors in the Kurukshetra war, yes, they all could have had their own karma by which uh, they, they may not be evil, they, they certainly not, not all of them were evil, the way say Duryodhan or Dushasan were. But they chose the side of evil. So when they died, it was because of their own karma. You could say it is some past karma because of they went to die and also their present karma that they made that choice. But because they died in the presence of the Lord, they ye ahave mukha ravinde, that you know that they because they died in the presence of the Lord, beholding him or being beheld by him. So they attained an auspicious destination. Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much. Shla Prabhupada ki. ग्रंथराज श्रीमद्भागवतम की दाय गौर प्रेमानंदे